while we're going over this too, you might want to have your periodic table handy, ready to go, because you'll be referring to it. Since they are called periodic trends, they are patterns across the periodic table or down the periodic table. So that's what we'll be looking at. Now, what is periodic law? We covered this has to do with that when elements are arranged in order of increasing atomic number, increasing atomic number, they show a peri uh, periodic rep uh, repetition in their chemical and physical properties. So we're going to see these trends that happen to go with the groups or happen to go with the periods. The general trends we're going to be looking at or shielding effect, atomic radius, ionization energy, electronegativity, and electron affinity. Now, there are two major forces or reasons, I say, as to why the trends happen the way that they happen. One of them is called effective nuclear charge. An effective nuclear charge has to do with really two things, but mainly we need to focus on, in the center here, these protons. The proton number, effective nuclear charge, is also known as Z. We give it that letter. It is a combination of the number of protons and the repulsions in the electron cloud. But the attractive force of the nucleus, because they have positive charges in the nucleus, are going to attract to electrons in the cloud. Positives attract negatives. If you have more protons, you're going to have a much stronger attractive force than if you have less protons. Yes, as you can see, it is a combination here by, based off of the arrows. The blue ones are showing the attractive force for the nucleus. These red ones, though, these are showing these electron repulsions occurring. So electron repulsions are going to work against the pull of the nucleus, but they're more minimal in comparison to that strength of the protons. The protons are going to be attracting the electrons in. If you have more protons, you have more attractive force. It's basically what we're going to be looking at and going with there. So, nuclear charge of an atom is given by the atomic number. The outer electrons don't experience the full attraction of the charge as they are shielded from the nucleus and repelled by the inner electrons. The effective nuclear charge is just slightly lower than its overall proton number. Okay. That's what we say, the nuclear charge would be the proton number. So it's just slightly less than that. It has to do with subtracting out a little bit of the electron repulsions. But what you should be referring to when you state a reason is the trend does this because it has a greater effective nuclear charge. Or it is doing this because uh, it has less protons, so it, it doesn't have as high effective nuclear charge or something like that. That is one reason you will state. Say, for instance, on free response on a test, where you need to state a reason for a trend. That is one of the possible choices you will choose from for stating a reason. The other one is basically having to do with the number of main energy levels present. As we go down the groups, we are going down the periods, you're going to be adding main energy levels. Main energy levels are like the shells around the nucleus. If you were talking about the Bohr model, they would, you know, we use that as a basic representation because it's simple to understand. But they're like basically those circles we draw around the nucleus, those main energy levels. Now, technically, we know that they are three-dimensional spaces, and there are the S's and the P's and D's inside them, and whatever. But for the main energy level, and that's the amount of space that these electrons are going to occupy, that is also going to be a major factor in why the trends happen the way that they happen. The attraction for the nucleus is reduced as the outer electrons is repelled by the inner ones, and they are shielded by the inner main energy levels or shells. Okay? So remember, like on our diagram here, this would be like n equals 1, this would be n equals 2, one more shell would be n equals 3. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about referring to the main energy levels. Main energy levels also correspond to the rows on the periodic table. Now, the first particular trend we're talking about is shielding effect. Shielding effect, of course, is a decrease in attraction between the nucleus and the valence electrons, the outer electrons, because of the additional energy levels. 
So basically, we say that they're like shields. So this would be n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3. As you go down a group, you add more energy levels, so you technically add more shields, and that lessens the attractive force of the nucleus on the outer valence electrons. How does the trend work? Moving left to right across the period, shielding stays the same. We noticed that also in our intro, where we were looking at how, when we graphed it, it was just a straight line across the period because they all are in the same main energy level, so they would stay the same. Why this trend is caused due to the fact that the main energy level within the period remains the same. Oops, let's go back, sorry. Let's go ahead and take a moment to write that down. Okay, now, going down the group, moving down a group, the shielding increases. Why? This trend is caused due to the fact when you go down a group, a new main energy level is added. So you're adding a new main energy level to it, creating larger, uh, more shields, more core electrons, never mind, more core electrons, creating more shields, and decreasing the pull of the nucleus on the outer electrons. So as you go down the group, you're adding more energy levels. More energy levels means more shields, and it lessens the pull of the nucleus. So for this particular one, the trend increases because adding new main energy levels creates more core electrons that shield the pull of the nucleus. That would be a way I would state that. Now let's look at some practice. So that's why I also had you pull out your periodic table. Which element has more shielding? Here we're looking at sodium versus cesium. Which one's going to have more shielding? Cesium, because sodium's in row three, cesium's in row six. Cesium has six main energy levels, therefore it's going to be a much greater shielding effect. How about carbon or oxygen? Here's carbon, here's oxygen. They are in the same period, so what does that mean? It's going to stay the same. So they do trick questions like that occasionally where you wouldn't want to choose either one. You would say no, they're in the same period, so they have the same amount of shielding. Atomic radius measure of the distance between the radii of two identical atoms of an element. And yes, you, they simply do not just calculate it based off the radius of one single atom. They actually put two of them together. They uh, get this diameter distance from nuclei to nuclei, and then they divide it by two. Which is silly. I don't understand exactly why they do this, but gets them the correct measure of how large the atom actually is. So for all intents and purposes, when we're referring to radius, we're basically talking about the size of the atom, okay? So the like radius from inside here out to the electron cloud. However, it is measured with the two identical atoms together. They take the diameter divided by two to get the radius. The trend for radius, moving down a group, the atomic radius increases. It's kind of the snowman effect here. Get bigger snowman, bigger sphere on the bottom, smaller spheres on the top. Why more main energy levels are added? As you can see, this is a one of, using one of the two reasons as to why a trend happens. This is the one that for going down a group, the main energy levels were adding more. So we are simply adding more electrons, which is going to make it bigger, but we're also lessening the pull of the nucleus because of the shielding. That's also going to cause the electrons to spread out a little bit more and make the size of the atom bigger. So it increases as you go down the group, and you're adding more main energy levels, you're adding more electrons, you're lessening the pull of the nucleus, electrons are spreading out, you get bigger. That's just the way it is. Each additional energy level shields the electrons from being pulled towards the nucleus. 
causing more of the spacing. Now, from left to right across a period, the atomic radius decreases. Why? The why is the effective nuclear charge is increasing. What do I mean by that? I mean, each successive element has one additional proton. So the attractive force between the nucleus and the electrons is, is going to increase. So as you can see, they don't increase dramatically, but from going from nitrogen here, which is atomic number um, seven to oxygen here, which is atomic number eight, it's a difference of one proton, but that one proton just is a little bit more attractive. It pulls the cloud in just slightly. So you get a little bit smaller of an atom. So as you can see, it's the, yes, fallen over snowman. Snowman has fallen over at this point. But as you see, going left to right, they decrease across the period. Getting smaller and smaller. So down a group, we have the snowman effect. Across the period, the snowman has fallen over. So let's look at these. Bigger, smaller. Let's look at potassium versus sodium. Pretty easy here. Which one's bigger? Potassium's going to be bigger. It has one more main energy level. So, and it all has more electrons. How about magnesium or sodium? These two right here, they're right next to each other. Which one's bigger? Sodium, because magnesium has one more proton, increasing its effective nuclear charge, making it just a little tad bit smaller. Okay, now let's rephrase the question and look from, from the other perspective, which is smaller, phosphorus or chlorine. Over here is phosphorus, here's chlorine. Chlorine is smaller. So chlorine has two more protons than phosphorus. So its greater effective nuclear charge is going to pull the cloud in just slightly. It's going to attract those electrons in just a little bit closer. So chlorine is smaller. Cations. Remember cations? Anybody remember cations or cations? They're not cations, they are cations. <laughs> Cat ions are positive ions because they did what with their electrons? They lost an electron. The loss of an electron will cause your cloud to become smaller. So really when we're looking at cations and anions, we're comparing them to their parent uh, neutral atom. So if you look here at Neutral lithium, the size is 1.52, and we're talking like picometers here, so really small, 10 to the minus 12. But lithium, in order to become stable, because it's an alkali metal, it has that one valence electron, it's going to give away that one valence electron and have a plus one charge. Look at size dramatically decreased at 0.6, much smaller number, just by losing that outer energy level. And you can compare, look at aluminum, 1.43, but remember aluminum, in order to achieve that stability, loses three electrons, so it goes down to 0.5, so it becomes even smaller, okay? So the general trend from the cation, you know, parent atom to the cation is it becomes smaller, you're losing out of the electron cloud. So I'm sure you can imagine for the anions, what is the possibility here? Now you're gaining electrons, so what should happen to the size? It should get bigger, right? Anions are negative. They are larger. They gain electrons. So gaining electrons adds to the cloud for one. And when you're adding more electrons, that causes more electron-electron repulsion, spreading them out even further, right? So when the electrons repel each other, they spread out even further. Here are looking at the data, nitride, when it's formed right here, N3 minus, it adds quite a huge amount to the, well, almost a whole, full, full one there. And like fluorine going, um, just adding one electron, adds to the cloud there, okay? 
Now, as you can see also though, fluorine is only one point, I mean fluoride, this is F minus, only 1.36, whereas nitride is 1.71. Anybody uh, tell me what the discrepancy there, why the fluoride is just smaller than the nitride? They have the same number of electrons, they both have 10. But why would the fluoride be smaller? Anyone? Fluoride has nine protons. Nitride only has seven. So by adding on those two additional protons, the effective nuclear charge of fluoride is greater and it has more attractive force, so it pulls the cloud in just slightly. That's why it's smaller than, say, the nitride over here. So that's, you know, still follows the same trend as regular atomic radius. The effective nuclear charge increases across the group. But fluoride is smaller than nitride. It's also smaller than oxide because it does have one more proton than oxide. So it pulls it in just slightly more than the oxide can. Generalized trends follows the same trend as atomic radius. Increase in size down a group and decrease across a period just like regular atomic radius does. Now, of course, you would be looking at the cation specifically section, which would be group one, group two, and group 13 or 3A. And then you would be comparing the um, anion section together, which is the you know 15 through 17, those groups, you would be comparing them in terms of their trends, because you wouldn't really want to compare you know, a cation to an anion in terms of their size. Then if we're comparing cation to parent atom, we can do that, and we can compare cations to other cations. Okay? Now I'll place the following in order of increasing size. I'll make sure everybody understands this word, increasing, because a lot of the periodic trend questions are either phrased as increasing or decreasing. So when I say increasing, I'm starting with the smallest and working to the largest. Everybody has a tendency to get confused on those. And so if I say decreasing, we're starting with the largest and working our way down to the smallest. Good. So out of these, which one is going to be the smallest in size following our normal trends here? The chloride here is going to be the smallest. Why? Chloride has... They all have 18 electrons, right? They've all gained electrons. They all look like argon now. So why is chloride smaller than sulfide or phosphide up here? Because it has more protons. That effective nuclear charge is higher. Okay? The anions all have 18 electrons, so you need to look at the number of protons. Phosphide only has 15, sulfide has 16, but chloride has 17. So by having more protons, you have more pull, attractive force, your cloud gets smaller. All right, follow that effective nuclear <coughs> charge reason. Okay? Now, ionization energy. The energy required to remove an electron from an atom, basically to form a cation. You're removing an electron. It does require some energy. But for certain elements, the energy is higher than others because some like to lose electrons, some don't like to lose electrons. Moving down the group, ionization energy is going to decrease. Why? Because with more energy levels, adding more main energy levels, more shielding, less attractive pull, less energy required to remove an valence electron. Your nucleus is not holding on very tight, it's easier to remove. A bond is not as strong, the uh, attractive force is not as strong, it's easier to remove. And like I said, you know, you can tell here, lithium and these guys over here, the alkali metals, their ionization energies are low. If you look over here at halogens, they're a lot higher. Halogens, though, want to gain. They don't want, they really want to lose. If you look at the noble gases that are already stable, 
they definitely don't want to lose an electron. They're very, very stable. So it takes a lot of energy to remove one from a noble gas. So generalized trends. Going across the period, left to right across the period, the ionization energy increases. Why? Because of an increasing effective nuclear charge. You have more attractive force on those electrons, holding tighter to those electrons. So a high ionization energy value indicates a strong hold. Strong hold on those electrons. They don't want to get rid of them. And the uh, metals on the left side of the table that form cations, they're going to have lower ionization energies than the nonmetals, who aren't interested in forming cations because that's not going to make them stable. They're more likely to want to form anions and gain electrons. So the increasing effect of nuclear charge, more protons means more attractive force, tighter hold on those electrons, harder to remove. If it's harder to remove, it takes more energy. Yes? Time to practice? No, trend down the group. Oh, for reactivity of the metals. If you look here, and we remember our video when we put that, we saw the alkali metals being put in water and how reactive they got as they went down the group. This is why, because of the lower ionization energy. It's much easier to remove an electron from, say, cesium down here because it has more shielding, has more main energy levels, has less attractive force from the nucleus. So it's a lot easier to pull off that electron. That also is going to make it very reactive. Whereas something like lithium at the top here that only has three protons but is a very small atom, those electrons are a lot closer to the nucleus. They don't have as many shields uh, and therefore it'd be harder to remove so the energy is higher. So metal reactivity gets larger as you go down the group. Francium would be the most reactive metal on the table. So this one shows you all the numbers, which is kind of nice. As you look over here, helium 2300, very high ionization energy. Um, over here, the lowest one, although they don't have the value of francium, Cesium down there is uh, 376. That's not a lot of energy. But generally, it increases as you go up and increases as you go to the right uh, due to these uh, effective nuclear charge to the right. It gets less down the group because of those main energy levels. Back to those two reasons. So following the same idea here, Okay, increases going up using ice cream as ice cream cone as the picture, and this way, of course, increases to the right. Now, I want to point out about this one. These are for successive ionization energies. So this is in the case where you're pulling off more than one electron. So if I'm sodium right here, sodium has one valence electron, sodium wants to lose that valence electron in order to become like a noble gas. So the ionization energy for the first electron is not that high. It's 495 or 500-ish, depending on which table you look at. However, if this is I2. This would be to remove the second electron. If I try to pull off a second electron, see how the number jumps up to 4,500? That is a dramatic increase in value. Why does it jump up like that? Because I'm not removing a valence electron anymore. I'm now starting to remove core electrons. Atoms do not like to lose their core electrons. So you'll notice on here the way the chart is set up. That's what the staircase is for. Under the staircase, those are considered valence electrons. Above the staircase, we're talking the core electrons. As you can see, the new numbers completely jump. So if we're looking at, say, aluminum, Aluminum is going to the plus three, so it loses one, loses two, loses three. But if you try to take off a fourth, which now is removing from the core, it goes up to 11,600. Serious dramatic increase in energy. Atoms do not like to lose their core electrons. So keep aware of 
this is how you would read this kind of chart. Under the staircase are the valence electrons. Those values are a lot less. Above the staircase, though, now you're starting to remove poor electrons, and it becomes a huge dramatic deal. Which element has a higher ionization energy, magnesium or calcium? Here's magnesium. Here's calcium. Magnesium has a higher ionization energy. It has less main energy levels. Therefore, it's smaller has more attractive force on the, from the nucleus, it's harder to remove the electron. Which, or which element has a higher ionization energy, aluminum or sulfur? Sulfur. Why would sulfur have the higher one? Has two more protons, so that means it has a greater effective nuclear charge. I know I keep saying it over and over again, but when you get to that pre-response and you need to put reasons down, you're going to like that I keep saying it over and over again. And last but not least, which element has a higher ionization energy, cesium or barium, which are down here? Cesium, barium. It's going to be barium, yes. Why? Greater effective nuclear charge. It has one more proton, right? All right, electronegativity. Electronegativity has to do with attracting electrons in a chemical bond. A chemical bond, the atom with the greater electronegativity, attracts strongly to other things. And yes, it's this like attractive pull. They're kind of like bullies. They come along and they want to grab onto electrons wherever they can. Well. Moving down the group, electronegativity decreases. Why? Because the addition of more energy levels, back to that idea here, more energy levels, offsets the attractive force of the nucleus. Moving left to right across the period, the electronegativity increases. I bet you can guess why. Because increasing what? Nuclear charge. <laughs> that effective nuclear charge, yes. I know I sound like a broken record, but you'll appreciate it later. Increasing effective nuclear charge. They have more protons, they have more pull, therefore more attraction. Yes? Uh-huh. Okay, <laughs> you're smiling at me. Now, here is the chart with the electronegativity values. What you should notice over here is fluorine is the highest and most electronegative element on the table. Second to only oxygen. Oxygen is also very electronegative. So that's why, if you think about it, why we have metals that have to be coated and whatever because they're exposed to air. There's lots of oxygen in air and oxygen has a tendency to rust things and corrode things because it's very electronegative. What's missing from the table though is the noble gases. Noble gases do not have electronegativity values because they have a full octet. They are already stable. They do not want to seek out electrons. So their electronegativity values are zero. This one's where you, you get tricked in the trick questions because they'll throw in a noble gas and you'll be like, oh, the trend is up and to the right, and you'll pick the one at the very end. No. This one you have to remember, noble gases are excluded. You would not choose a noble gas here. They do not have electronegativity values. Okay? So we notice that the noble gases are not on here. They already have a full octet. They're not seeking electrons. Now, this also is part of the reason why the reactivity of nonmetals increases as you go up the group. Why does it increase as you go up the group? Increases in reactivity. Why? More electronegativity. Smaller size, more attractive pull by the nucleus. Okay? So, Nonmetals will become more reactive as you go up the group. It's kind of like 
the uh, ionization energy trend with the metals being more reactive down the group. This is kind of latching on to the electronegativity. But they become more reactive as you go up and to the right. Of course, excluding the noble gases, because the noble gases aren't looking to react with anything. So let's practice which element is more electronegative, fluorine or chlorine. Fluorine, chlorine. Definitely fluorine. It's a smaller atom, more attractive pole. Which element's more electronegative, sodium or potassium? More electronegative is going to be the smaller one. Yes, sodium there. Which element's more electronegative, looking down here at tin and iodine? Iodine, in this case, it would be a higher effective nuclear charge because it has more protons for iodine. Now, electron affinity is the amount of energy released when an atom gains an electron. So this is for those anion ones over here to the right. We're going to be looking at graphs like this next class and analyzing them. It follows the same trend as electronegativity. Basically, you know, it's up and to the right. It increases. And no noble gases aren't a part of electron affinity either because they're not seeking to gain electrons. So they're not going to want to release energy. Their electron affinities are actually above zero. They're not a releasing amount because you would have to force energy on them in order for them to take an electron. Now, this is the summary of the trends in a quadrant plane. This is a method I use to memorize the different trends because there's so many of them it gets confusing. If you memorize this, then you can write it on your paper on the test. Right when you get the test and I say go, you can write this down. And then it summarizes all of them for you. And when you're asked a you know, periodic trend questions, it's easy to not get them confused because you have the visual aid to help you. So how do we read this chart? Let me show you. What it is, basically, the quadrants, just like in math, OK? And this is how I would write it down on my paper. I wouldn't write out the full word. I'd just put like AR for atomic radius, MR for metal reactivity down here. I'd put S down here for shielding. And over here, you would put like electronegativity, ionization energy, electron affinity, and non-metal reactivity. So that's what I would do. I'd write that down on my paper. What does it mean, though? So anything down here in this quadrant means it's going to increase if I go left, increase if I go down. Anything in this quadrant up here increases if I go up, if I go to the right. Just like you would, the arrows are pointing in increasing directions for you. Shielding, of course, only increases as you go down. So that's why we put the S there just with the bottom down arrow. This is a nice visual aid to remember all of the trends. Like I said, if you memorize it, and realize that in the quadrants, I'm increasing in that direction. So for atomic radius and metal reactivity, I'm increasing as I go left and down. The other four, electron le electronegativity, ionization energy, electron affinity, and non-metal reactivity, I'm increasing if I go up and to the right. And shielding, I'm incre increasing if I go down. So do you remember, though, these ones I starred for you? Don't get tricked by the noble gases because they're not involved in those particular trends. The only one up here in the quadrant that the noble gases take part in is the ionization energy trend. This is a, a good way to memorize them. That way you're memorizing them all with their increasing directions. OK, it's a good system it can get confusing if you're trying to remember that this one increases this way, this one decreases that way, and you know, like here's another summary, but once again, you know, you want to have it all going in the same increasing direction, that way you're not getting them confused. But I like this one better, so I would stick with this one. Whichever way works for you, they are, have to be memorized, you have to know them, They're, you have to know what they are, and the reasons why they do what they do, and then you have to be able to pick out which element 
is higher or lower than the other based off of the trend. 